largest area of unbroken wilderness in North America is located in the boundary region of Canada's Northwest Territories and Nunavut. At the heart of this zone is the 56,000 square kilometer Thelon Wildlife Sanctuary, which has successfully protected game animals there from hunting for almost a century. Escalating climate change and increased mining activity have now emerged as the chief threats to the existence of caribou, muskox, and other large mammals that form the backbone of life in this vast landscape. In the summer of 2009, Taku Hokoyama and myself, Frank Wolf, set off from the city of Yellowknife on a 2,000 kilometer canoe journey through these backlands in order to reach the town of Rankin Inlet on the Hudson Bay coast. My son Ashitaka, he's uh, seven weeks old. This summer I have a, a canoe trip planned. We're leaving my new family for about 50 days or so. I'm, I'm really concerned about the, uh, his, his future. A lot of uh, environmental catastrophes await. Uh, you know, it's going to happen during his lifetime. Connecting this to a canoe trip is a bit of a stretch, but uh, you know, this is my way of sort of helping. Uh, helping the world be at least a little bit better in the future. Everybody that I've ever told that I was going to go on this trip with my son only at seven weeks and you know they said I was going to get divorced or they looked flabbergasted and uh, pretty much the only person who hasn't been flabbergasted is my wife. She's the only one who really understands so far why I'm going on this trip. Yeah and uh, that that's good enough. I don't need anybody else to understand as much. I understand, Taku. Yeah, <laughs> I knew you. <laughs> well, you asked me to come. <laughs> You're quite pushy. that you thought it would be more effective for you to be in the legislature? You know, uh, I think uh, my concern about climate change was, was the, uh, the driving factor for me. I, I see big things happening and, and big impacts uh, and at the same time big opportunities uh, for doing a much better job and uh, addressing those, those concerns. Uh, in my research in the Central Arctic and, and actually Nunavut, I had a research station for 13 years and I was starting to see tremendous environmental change happening uh, as the climate changed there, or at least the annual weather conditions. Um, over the 13 years, uh, the spring had advanced by uh, at least a week and uh, over a week in the fall, and I was seeing changes in the bird populations and so on. Uh, so it, it struck me how rapid things are changing. So it's July the 9th and it was cold last night. Um, I had to snuggle right up into my bag in the tent. And you can see the whole canoe here is covered in froth. Warm? 
Yeah. All of the water in the Northwest Territories comes from outside of the Northwest Territories. Right. Just south of the NWT border, north of Fort McMurray, is the oil sands development. And um, there we're seeing huge tracts of land being clear cut, 130 square kilometers of tailings ponds being developed. And uh, oftentimes they're right against the Athabasca River. These tailings ponds pose a huge risk to the uh, to the water in the Athabasca River, which then flows north into the Slave River and then into Great Slave Lake. Water is, is the mode of travel for many, many groups in the north, many people in the north. It's also the way in which, it's, it's also the, the resource that sustains the land, sustains the wildlife. So the quality of the water, people say, I've heard the term water is life mm -hmm. and water is boss. They all mean the same thing. Without water, what are we, right? It, uh, it sustains everything we have, and so we must keep our water safe in order to keep our, our way of life. We are approaching the town of Lutzel K, a Diné First Nation uh, village here at the east end of Slave Lake, Great Slave Lake. And uh, this will be our last stop for about 30 or so days. So we're going to grab a couple things, talk to a couple people, and keep on heading on. <laughs> okay, we are here at the uh, Lutzel K uh, band office, and we're gonna go in and talk to Chief Steve Nita. What does uh, what does the land mean to the people? Everything. Well, Lutzel K is a traditional Dene community that is uh, propelled into Western society. What took Western society 500 years has taken us less than 50. We were a hunters and gather society 25 years ago. I, for an example, grew up in the bush on the trap lines in tents. I never spoke a word of English till I was 10 years old in kindergarten. So that's my society, that's my people. So right now we're just going through a probably, uh, I don't know, a five or ten year old burn and it, uh, yeah, it's just birches, no trail, fallen burn trees. We've been going for quite a while now, it's getting late, bugs are hopping and we're just kind of shuttling back and forth, leapfrogging our gear slowly towards the Snowdrift River where we hope to camp tonight at some point. We should keep going. We're still out here, but we're close. Right, Hoko? We're close. Welcome to my world. Approaching 10 o'clock, and we're doing a bushwhack through the burn, 
and I can see the river, the Snowdrift River, which means no portages for a couple of days, hopefully. Whew. It's about a four hour ordeal. Go ahead, Elko. I'm gonna follow you down. This way. Mosquitoes here don't look very good at all. Mm. These are all mosquitoes. Not special effect. This is not like an exaggeration. Muskox we just saw off the river. This is where he was he was uh, lying down and you see these big kind of grooves here and that's where he, he was pawing at the sand and just kind of dug in. The back here is where the big massive body was. These are just gigantic creatures. Taku, can you smell there? What's it smell like? It smells like hay, except after it's been eaten and digested and it came out the other end. That's why they call it musk. Musk. <laughs> musk. Musk of ox. Be a musk ox. Yeah, be a musk ox. Yeah, do it. Yeah. He's gonna come get you. Tough day uh, paddling up the Eileen River, lots of dragging up uh, upstream, not marked the map, kilometer after kilometer. Um, so we're going really slow on our way up to the divide. From uh, dragging the canoe, um, I've, I've bashed my shin in the same spot multiple times, and uh, the wound stays uh, wet all day uh, in, in various uh, types of water and uh, it's been uh, swollen, red, and uh, very uh, tender to the touch, so I was kind of wanting to eliminate infection. to Northwest Territories to get a lot of uh, large mammals hopefully on film and, uh, and still pictures as well but uh, but one thing we didn't expect is to uh, get the first ever video of the uh, the Canadian snow leopard so that was um, uh, a huge bonus unbelievable it was beautiful
so we're camped here tonight on the Eileen River on this big spit of sand. And it's uh, one of the few open areas uh, in this big forest area around us. And all around me are uh, hundreds and hundreds of tracks of, uh, of caribou, musk ox, and moose. And uh, probably the main reason they come out here is it's the one area for them to get relief from the bugs. Like the bugs hammer these big mammals all the time in the forest. If there's a breeze coming through here, it would keep the bugs down. They can hang out, lull in the sand, and get a little bit of relief. What happened to your lip? Oh, uh, just a couple of mosquitoes kissed me. Maybe two, three. I had a good time. You're a dirty boy. Oh, don't, don't tell my family. Koyama, how are you after today's extravaganza? Uh, pretty, pretty rough. <laughs> I've had this uh, toe issue that's uh, been bugging me for a while. Every morning I wake up and my uh, toes are actually sensitive and they're a little swollen. And today uh, they uh, seem to be exacerbated by the constant uh, being wet all day, being cold all day. And then uh, the distances weren't great, but we did quite a few portages. So. Uh, there's a fewer on the horizon, and I'm looking forward to it. It is the end of the day, July 21st, 2009, and it's my birthday. Two years ago to this day, I was on a 75-day trip with Taku Hokoyama and he forgot my birthday and it hurt me a lot so I'm going to confront him now because he hasn't said anything all day and see if he forgot my birthday again I'm Taku Okoyama Hello What day is it today? What day is it today? Uh, today is uh, three weeks of tripping Yes. Oh no, oh, no! It's your birthday! It's your birthday! <laughs> it's your bir Happy birthday, man! Wait, I just think, hold on a second. Yeah. I had the thing prepared all along. Oh, you see? <laughs> a bouquet of Labrador. I had that. Thanks. For you. I had no idea. I, I thought you'd forgot again, just like our last trip. <laughs> no, no. That's not possible. I can't forget anymore. <laughs> You're just waiting for that, weren't you? That's an area that uh, my people uh, hold dear to their hearts. It's uh, an area where my people began their civilization according to the oral history. It's an area where God began for us. Hello there. After almost 700 kilometers, of grinding to get to this point, this is the very beginning of the Thelon River. 
and which flows through the heart of the largest wilderness area in North America. Yip, yip! One, two, three, hey! Yeah, so the lovely thing about, uh, about black flies and mosquitoes in combination, but especially black flies, is that when you do your morning movement, they, uh, you expose your skin only for like five seconds. You know, you, you wait until it builds and builds and builds and you're ready to go and boom, you do it. And then they're on you, like about a hundred of them. And uh, you pull your pants up, but then there's still probably about a dozen or so crawling inside your pants because uh, mosquitoes kind of stay on the outside, but black flies, Black flies uh, crawl under your clothes and just crawl and crawl and crawl. Once they get exposed flesh, they go to town. Really huge clouds above us right now. Massive, massive. Like something from out of Ghostbusters. What the hell? That's thing, Coco. Beginning of the end. We were just here in the um, on the Thelon, saw this big bull moose, and uh, and here he is just behind me. I just, just saw him eating grasses in the in the water, and uh, there he goes off into the bush. When you're out there paddling all day, do you ever think about your son Ashitaka and maybe how? how this trip and the education you're you're giving here can kind of help him in the future. Yeah, I, I can't not help think about him. I, I think about him every day. Um, I think about my wife every day. Yeah, I, I miss them both greatly, so, so much more than I could have ever imagined. But at the same time, uh, a primary motivator for me to go on this trip was uh, was to, to learn firsthand, you know, what's going on with the environment or, you know, um, last time on a similar trip, we, we also talked to people who had great things to say and so I was looking very forward to that on this trip and, and it's already happened so many times, many fold already. Uh, so and as far as I'm concerned that's, that's greater than any university education um, that, that a person could get of which I, I have plenty. So uh, it, it's been incredible, uh, absolutely worth it for sure for me, m my son and my wife. Just writing a letter here to the, uh, the North Wind. Um, yeah. Dear Mr. North Wind, how are you? I'm writing to tell you that my friend Taku and I 
have been canoeing down the Thelon River for the past five days. We've noticed you've been extremely persistent and strong, and we're wondering if you could take a vacation until we were done the river. Love. Frank. That should do it. North wind does not respond to letters. Uh, we're just coming through an area called the Gap, and it is howling. Ow! Yeah, so we're just uh, paddling along on the uh, Thelon here, and uh, just along this strand of beach. Up and down here, uh, an Arctic wolf was uh, was uh, rocking back and forth, and um, he's tucked into the bush here behind me, um, probably looking at me. I saw him a couple minutes ago, uh, wondering what I'm doing here, and uh, his tracks are all up and down this beach, kind of running uh, back and forth everywhere this way. I'm standing here in the uh, remains of John Hornby's cabin. John Hornby is one of the uh, figures actually central to having this whole uh, Thelon uh, wildlife sanctuary protected. He made a suggestion um, in the mid-20s to actually have it uh, set aside uh, to protect the wild game here, basically. Um, what he did, though, in 1926 was he tried to come up here and live off the land. So he brought his two friends, uh, Edgar Christian and Harold Adler, um, up here with him. And they were counting on uh, surviving off caribou because he'd seen a large caribou migration in the same area um, the year before. Uh, but unfortunately, the caribou never came. And over the course of uh, less than a year, they, they starved to death. So the three men were buried just down from the cabin here. Um, on my left is Edgar Christian. In the middle is John Hornby. And the far side is Harold Adler. Um, small, small errors in judgment have uh, very big consequences when you're uh, isolated out here. And uh, slowly starving to death would have been a very tough way to go, especially in the cold of winter. So uh, lessons directly applicable to us, even. First Nations, and we have to make a decision. You know, is the benefit of this project outweigh the benefit of the security that the land provides? All right, so we're out here on the Upper Thelon, and we've seen this little helicopter uh, cruising around us all day, kind of landing and then taking off. Um, so most likely, it's part of a little survey camp, uh, and the surveys here are mostly for mining. So you can see that uh, mining companies are laying the groundwork uh, to. Uh, extract uh, uranium, diamonds, and that sort of thing from the land up here. Trying to find that balance is always going to be a challenge. For example, caribou migration route. You have three diamond mines up there. Those companies are right in the caribou migration route. They have a, a, a protocol. If there's a caribou in the way, the caribou has the right way. But even with that, we're seeing the impacts of those projects. Mm -hmm. Caribous are moving further east and west of that migration route. I think they're going around it instead of going through it now. So it's impacting us and it's the ability for us to, to go out and harvest these uh, 
caribou that is becoming more difficult, more expensive, because it's further away from our community. Yeah, so that was uh, just pure, pure chance. You know, uh, there's no guarantees to ever see uh, the, the migration up here. It could be weeks off. You never know where they're going to cross, where you're going to come across them. And uh, we just lucked out as we're just exiting the main part of the Thelon River towards Beverly Lake, their calving grounds. Um, so, yeah, just, uh, yeah, we lucked out. No doubt about it. Very powerful. Uh, experiencing that many thousands of animals uh, just moving across the land as they have for thousands of years and, uh, and the people up here who, who've lived up here for, for thousands of years as well um, they've depended on them this the, these guys are the they are the backbone of this uh, this landscape up here uh, everything feeds off them uh, without the caribou there are no people there's no bears there's no wolves there's nothing and they're what makes this kind of uh, very barren, barren landscape uh, so diverse and, and rich with life. Caribou, they are finely tuned, as most organisms are, to their environment, uh, which evolved over a long, long period of time and is relatively stable compared to the change we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. One of the things for caribou is the timing of their calving, which is acutely tied to the, the flush of green growth um, which happens incredibly rapidly in the tundra where mm -hmm. there's very little snow. So all it takes is above freezing or, or even slightly below mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you get this flush of uh, really it's the protein and, and the lipids that are stored in the roots of plants. They get flushed into the tip of those plants and that really enables them to produce nourishing milk and uh, ensure calf survival and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a two week change in that date so it's it's no longer synchronized with the birth of the calves and, and that's a highly synchronized event uh, then it has implication for the survival of caribou. Okay, Paul. <laughs> What was Baker Lake like when you first got here? Good luck, farming. Tamao nga kayo kapsi. Kanyo ila pa ka manito. Kaya yung ito ang ilap ko wala. Ano na may utaw hawak na sa kawalaw ko. Kaya ano na may utaw yung ihamak kawalak na kami. Hulo kayo ng tunik. Tuk tunik, amak konik. Ito ito ang ilap ko. Pilaya ka taksi ito mo't kakawaya na kapat. How important are the caribou to the Inuit here? Like to us, it's really, really important. Like if we, like if we eat white man food every day, we yeah. eat it. Yeah, yeah. Most of us, like me and my husband, mm -hmm. or my kids, would have heartburn most of the day. But if we have caribou meat, country food, like How for you? lunch and. Either for lunch or supper, it's all right with our body. What do you see as a relationship between the caribou and the wolf? He would like to eat and take from the inner world to eat to have a tuk tuk to eat from the amakko to come in the world to eat tuk to eat to have a amakko to tuk to me to have a tap to have a lot of tap. Taku, what does DOG stand for? 
Dog. He's gonna <laughs> Don't eat the camera. Not possible. Still holding down. <laughs> is that uh, caribou meat? What kind of meat yeah. is that? Yeah. What I usually do is give her the shot up parts of it. The, wherever it was shot, the shoulders, the ribs. Save that for the dog. Looks good. Looks great. <laughs> She's enjoying it. You just don't kill an animal. You kill an animal with the thought of producing clothing for yourself in the winter. Mm -hmm. The edge is the most important when you're making clothing out of it. And you have to kill it at a certain time of the year, which is August. Mm -hmm. Second week in August, you can't just kill it if you want to make clothing out of it. You have to um, know when to kill, kill it, so the skin is perfect to make clothing out of it. And then you dry it with the sun, away from the sun. If you dry it with the sun, I'm drying it with the wind. It depends on the season. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, what kind of clothing do you make out of these skins? Coats, a mounted for carrying babies, mm -hmm. pants. So this is the pants here, right? The pants. Our pants are cool pants. They yeah. are. They would be hot in the city. The kids would love it. Those? Hi. So who, uh, what were those used for? What did they do? To keep you from getting snow blind. Mm. They're really functional. We're, we're the only ones that introduce eyeglasses. Got some uh, great footage again of uh, of a snow leopard, um, like something that's never been filmed before. And now to have seen it uh, like a handful of times like this is just amazing. And I think it speaks to uh, the environment actually being quite healthy when a when a predator at the top of the food chain like that um, is so evident. Day 41 and uh, we're on Chesterfield Inlet. Um, as the crow flies, probably about 100, 150K from uh, Hudson's Bay, but still a couple hundred K left in our trip uh, to get to Rankin. But we're definitely on the ocean, eight foot tide, um, lots of kelp around everywhere, um, that smell of the ocean. So uh, it's definitely a, a major transition. over the tundra and I'm dragging the canoe uh, instead of carrying because the wind all it catches like a sail so just got it rigged up to my PFD and uh, cruising along here and this 
will get us the Heidel land and get us into the Meliadine river system, which uh, flows down to Rankin Inlet. Barren Lands is definitely an unfair description of this area. During the short summers, um, the place just explodes with berries, seven, eight different kinds. Um, there's a good reason why uh, birds make such a long distance, and they normally live in trees, but they're willing to live on the ground and raise their young here. Just incredibly, incredibly rich. Taku, what has happened to your hand? I, I don't know. It's uh, just um, weathering in the north. It seems to slowly eat the body away. So we're just doing a traditional celebration here on the uh, shores of Hudson's Bay. Um, the, uh, the pipe we have here is actually carved by an Inuk artist in uh, Baker Lake. The, uh, the front of it is a musk ox out of soapstone and the shaft is actually caribou bone. And inside we put some lichen, often in, in nomadic times the Inuit would uh, pick pieces of plants off the ground and just uh, smoke them for relaxation. Um, so basically, with that, we are celebrating the three main components of our journey. The uh, Inuk artist who made the pipe represents the people. The uh, musk ox and caribou represents all the animals we saw. And the lichen represents the land. So we salute all three of them in celebration of our journey. Boom! <laughs> Mm. So Taku, tell us what you're eating there. This is a uh, fresh caribou liver that was actually um, uh, uh, hunted by our, our gracious hosts here. Um, it's amazing. Unbelievably good. Who would have thought we'd roll into Rankin Inlet and receive this kind of hospitality? This is, uh, it's good to be alive. Still a Model S child of the world. Yeah. Happy right to on. be back, but still happy to have gone on the trip. It's uh, life is good when you have to choose between tough things. Ed Noy Boone, when are you going to let Taku go on the trip again? Very soon, uh, next week. <laughs> That's up to Ashitaka. Do you realize you're the envy of men around the world? What? Why? Because of. Taku? <laughs> your generous nature with Taku. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know how generous I'm going to be after this. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, Ed Noy, for this one. Oh, you're welcome.
Bye.